How you been, first of all? Oh, man, I've been good, man. I've been good, man. Just working. Working like a, a, a Hebrew slave, you know? Okay. Okay. Let's talk about, you know, first of all, before we get into everything else, let's talk about your new project. It's uh, Angels and Demons, right? Right, right. DJ Drama did the mixtape, and you, you and DJ Drama go back, because, you know, I remember even when I was partying with y'all, DJ Drama was out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, me and Drama since, like, 2002, something like that. Okay. That's yep. what's up. We got hey, about 13 got, years in. Yeah, you got Rick Ross on it. Who else you got on I it? I got uh, Ross, uh, Young Buck, Safari, uh, the SB Stunts dude, uh, Jim, yeah. Jim Jones. Q. Yep, Q is on it, Cap One. Tell me about this project. How did it come together? You know what, man? I just dealing with these angels and demons, man. You know, everyday life, you know, type deal. You know, outside of my, my last mixtape I dropped in 2012 was uh, The Da Vinci Code. So yeah, this Angels and Demons was the sequel, you know. But at the same time, you know, I'm dealing with them real life angels and demons every day with the decision making process of just everyday life. I just think that the angels and demons is something that everybody deals with it's not just rappers or you know people that's listening to hip-hop or whatever the regular working people they deal with these same angels and demons all day you know even just the regular person at the at the stoplight when somebody's still at the light when it turns green and you go to Wong, land on the horn like yo get the f out the way you know what i'm saying that's them demons on you at the end of the day i'm just playing on those those you know that thought process so you know a lot of the world got to know you through BMF. Right. You know, when did you kind of join that whole that whole crew? Well, you know, um, there was no BMF when, when I started rocking with Meech. You know what I'm right. saying? And there was no big crew when I started rocking with Meech. Um, mm -hmm. I actually got with Meech uh, through DJ Pooh. Uh, Meech and, a, and, a, and, and one of his other partners had a, a label situation uh, entitled Stomping Ground Entertainment. And that's how my relationship with Meat sprung up. It wasn't until after we got real cool and I started bringing my people in and stuff like that. And then he brought more people in to where we, we, we had enough people that you can actually call a crew. And then once we had a crew and we was going back and forth to Atlanta from California, um, you know, they start calling us Meachie's boys. And he didn't, and, and he got tired of that. He was like, all right, man, I'm tired of people saying meet these boys. We need to figure out something to call what we got. And then one of my cousins was like, yo, we should be BMF. And then, you know, we just threw a bunch of BMF meanings around the BMF acronym that evening around a big, uh -huh. you know, the big dinner table that we would always eat together at. And then that's how BMF was born. You know, and then from there, you know, it just spread like wildfire. You know, once we was doing everything we was doing, getting to that money crazy, more people coming around, getting involved. And then, you know, that just kind of spiraled to what we have today, you know? Right. Now, this was like 2004, One. I think. Oh. When, you know, someone I knew hit me up and said, hey, man, these guys called BMF want to fly you out to Atlanta. And uh, they're going to give you a few dollars, and they just want you to party with them for a couple of days because they're, they're fans of your mixtapes and so forth. So I'm like, all right, fuck it, you know? Right. I, you know, I, I don't think I've ever actually been to Atlanta at that point. So we went out there. You and I met and became cool during that time. And, and I got to know, like, you know, got to meet the rest of the, you know, the crew. You know, uh, I was actually, you know, got to meet Meech. Right. You know, at, at that time. And, you know, and I tell people this story sometimes is that the level y'all partied at was something I have not seen before or after. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it could get a little out of control at times, but still control. You know, um, Vlad, we was just trying to have fun, bro. You know that, you know, when you came around, it was just love in the air, period. Like a lot of yeah. people don't know us, they just get... You know what they get from TV or from a documentary or something or word of mouth from somebody that don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just it was just so much love, bro. Like we just like to have fun. We like to have a good time. Now at the end of the day, that that's what that's what we did. We went around this nation and we partied and we had a good time, man. And and, and you know that that's all we did at the end of the day. 
You know, when it came to moving around state to state and, 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 and being around good people and having good people around us, that's all we wanted. You know what I'm saying? I was trying to tap into to, to entertainment as far as music is concerned at that time through BMF. But we was having so much fun, man. The fun overshadowed everything. I'm speaking, you know, at the time I was kind of new in the game, but right now I'm speaking from, you know, 15 years in the game, and I still have not had as much fun as I did with y'all that, that one weekend. Yeah, you know, I could imagine, you know, the strip club, the regular club, the bottles, the girls. That's the experience that, that these rappers rap, or, rap about. You know what I'm saying? That's the real life experience of a celebrity. That, that experience that you had with us. And, and we lived it day in and day out for years, you know? No, I, I, absolutely. Like, you know, it, it, was, it was on a different caliber. And what was crazy was like, y'all had the billboard, the world is BMFs. That was a mixtape. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, that was a mixtape. The world is BMFs was a mixtape. So the billboard was a promotion platform for, for, you know, for my tapes. We had bought the billboard, so everything that I was doing while I was branding and promoting could be seen as soon as you left the airport. As soon as you came to Atlanta, boom, I wanted it on your mind. As soon as you're like, what is this? Like, okay, so, you know. A lot of people thought that we just had a billboard, like just a billboard. Nah, that was all part of marketing and promotion for, for my company. It looked insane, though. Like, it's like, yo, BMF is flying me out. I get out the airport and I see a big bill, billboard that says the world is BMFs. That's that marketing. So, you, you know, if you need anybody on the marketing team over at Vlad TV, I'm always available. You can just reach me at my daytime phone. Area code 404. No, I'm just bullshit. <laughs> hey, man. I mean, we still talking about that marketing scheme. So, obviously, it worked. It worked. It worked. I mean, they talk about it on the History Channel. Even though people got it misconstrued as we were just a drug team that was taunting the DEA by saying the world is BMFs and you know all this other stuff that they made up about it which wasn't true this was a marketing ploy for BMF Entertainment Incorporated the 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 actual record label um inter slash entertainment company at that time um yeah that was actually uh the world is BMFs was actually a mixtape that was released by me in like 2004, I believe, or three. How'd you hook up with, uh, with SB Stunts? SB, um, you know what? I got plugged with SB through, um, through Juvie, the engineer. And um, we have a mutual friend, and Juvie was in LA working with SB. And then he was like, yo, you know what I'm saying? SB got this record, you know what I'm saying? You want to see if you want to jump on it because it's actually SB's record. But yeah, Juvie plugged us. You know, he sent me the joint and it's called Mob and it's, it's dope. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's basically, ha it has to do with, you know, when, when a chick grab your phone and go to going through your phone, that mean you ain't mobbing no more. You know, we was doing everything until you touched my phone. Now you didn't went into my personal private space and now we can't mob no more. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Was this record done when SB was still with Nicki Minaj or, or afterwards? I don't know exactly what their status was, but it wasn't public that they wasn't dealing with each other. What about Jim Jones? Like, how did that record come together? Well, you know, me, me and Jim, you know what? Actually, what the funny part is, is I didn't even put the record with Jim Jones on the mixtape. But I released it. Well, the first record from this Angels and Demons project it's called Lil Nigga, and I got a video out and everything, but it was supposed to come out so long ago that when I, I dropped the video in the summertime, you know what I'm saying, when we had first shot it, and then I never even put the, the actual record on the mixtape. Now, I got another record with Jim Jones on it, and then when I turned the masters in for the mixtape, I gave them the wrong version without Jim Jones on it, you know what I'm saying? So we got a record called M.I.A. that we shoot this crazy video for in Miami, and we doing the Bad Boys 2 theme for the, um, for the video, and I don't even have the version with Jim Jones on the tape. By the time I listened back to the tape, we was rushing to get it out that next morning, and I just listened to the mix, and you know, just the first few seconds of the record to make sure it was the right mix, and then didn't, didn't get the right version. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I've been catching flack too. People have been hitting my um my my page, like, yo, what happened to uh to Jimmy on the mixtape? I'm like, yo, <laughs> we coming back with the video, so we'll be alright. I'd heard a story 
Because I remember I asked someone who knew Meech the craziest thing he's ever experienced with Meech. And he said that this one weekend, Meech said, we're going, to, we're going to Mexico, I think Cancun or something. And when he said we, he meant everyone. And he rented a commercial plane and literally put like every rapper, stripper, whoever. That was Cancun. That was um, Memorial Weekend, 2004, I think. That summer, 2004. That was Memorial Weekend. And we chartered a, a 747. And we flew like, I think, 250 people out. We had a lot of people. The Brat was on the plane. I believe Lil Scrappy was on the plane. Um, it was quite a few celebrities and and stuff on a plane. Uh, Eva Pickford, I believe, flew out. I don't know if she flew on a plane with us or if she was just there. But I remember it was a bunch of people. We had a ball in Cancun. Um, you know, we couldn't get any guns over in Cancun. So when we got there, we all bought knives just to, you know, just make sure that we had security. You know, we went in the store and bought like little pocket knives from the liquor store or something like that. <laughs> but it was a peaceful time. You know, there wasn't a fight or or stabbing or anything like that that went on. I heard that Meech actually wanted to fly the plane because he felt since he paid for the plane, he should be able to steer it a little bit. But they wouldn't let him in. The nah, plane. they wouldn't let him do it. Yeah, they wouldn't let him do. It. He wasn't gonna try to do that anyway. I know. He was. Just just joke. <laughs> so we know that story. I want to hear. I want to hear Blue Da Vinci's craziest Big Meech story. I got one for you. All right. So we go to um, birthday bash in Atlanta, two thousand three. Um, you know that's the big concert for for hot. Um, I mean one hundred seven nine is has birthday bash in um, in Atlanta. So one year we go to birthday bash um, and. It was so many of us that they, they wouldn't let everybody in. It might have been maybe 60, 70 of us. <laughs> they wouldn't let everybody in the concert. So Meech was the kind of person like, either we all go or none of us going in. So he was like, you know what? This is what we're going to do. Yo, Juice, get the helicopter gassed up. We're going to go throw money over the crowd. So we flew up in a helicopter over birthday bash and drop the money out of trash bags over the top of the crowd out of a helicopter because they wouldn't let us in. You know, we were supposed to be on the stage and throw the money into the crowd, but we, we dropped the, the money and flyers from one of my mixtapes over the whole crowd at Birthday Bash. That's when it was still outdoor. That was before it went to the arena. And, the, and Birthday Bash was still outdoors. And that was pretty crazy because he just was like, you know what, they don't want to let us in, forget this, bro. Let's just go get up in the air on them and just, just fly over the whole crowd and just throw the money out the helicopter. I'm like, yeah, yeah, all right. He's like, all right, so come on, jump in. <laughs> I'm like, oh, y'all, you, you serious? Like, we really finna go jump in the helicopter and throw the money? Out? All right, let's go, you know what I'm saying? So that was a pretty crazy experience. How much money got thrown out? I, you know what, I can't pin the number on it. Maybe like... You know, maybe it wasn't nothing crazy. Maybe like fifteen thousand or something like that. But it was garbage bags full of money. Yeah, yeah, garbage bags with the money and the and the um and the promotion, the the promotion plaque cards for the uh for the mixtape as well. And all you can see is all of this stuff. Just you know, this is a long distance between the the helicopter and the crowd. You know, in the ground, so the money right. just spread out so far. It seems like everybody there got a dollar. I don't remember where we even got on that helicopter at. It was, it was somewhere else, I believe, of like Fulton Industrial or something. We got in that helicopter that time. But we had access, with, you know, to pilots and, and stuff like that, though, definitely. You, listen, you got access to a pilot, you got you a jet, buddy. I don't think that there's ever been a, a crew as big as y'all that's had the type of impact on hip hop because you guys were so intermixed. BMF keeps getting, you know, mentioned. Yeah, Drake just... Um, um, Shouted me and Meech out in uh, 10 bands. Take a flick, I live like Meech, he live like Blue Da Vinci. Now, you know, Vlad, I'm one record away right now from, be from being him. You know what I'm saying? I'm just searching for the record. I I've got so much good music. You know what I'm saying? I'm just searching for that one. I just need that one. As soon as that one catches, we out of here, baby. We back, we back in Cancun. I'm finna fly you back to Atlanta and every, we finna do it all over again. Little Mouse actually wore a BMF chain in one of his videos. Yeah, you know, and he wears them in all of the videos. He wears it in all of the videos. Okay. How, what, what's, the, what's the little mouse connection with BMF? I you know, Big Cuz. You remember my cousin, Big Cuz, from Compton? Yeah. With the hair? You Bull and Big Cuz. They was brothers. They're the ones that did the, the interview for the History Channel. You know, Big Cuz is part of Hella Band's music group. So Mouse is one of, you know, Mouse is the artist on Hella Band's music group. So, uh -huh. you know, that's where his connection to BMF comes in through, through Big Cuz. 
you know, so big cuz, you know, he's been out in Chicago and stuff and what with, with, with Mouse. Mouse done been all down at my house in Atlanta recording and stuff like that. That's family. You know what I'm saying? Little dude is family. Oh my little mouse drill shit. Yeah, yeah, he a drill sergeant, man. Little mouse is the drill sergeant, man. Young dude, drill sergeant. Yeah, he he was at my crib, bro. We 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 in the studio at the crib. He working. You know what I'm saying? Little mouse worked though. One thing about mouse, he 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 outwork the average person his age for sure. Even older cats, he he's gonna outwork them. You know what I'm saying? So he's got his day in the sunshine coming too, and he's gonna stay working. That's his thing. He's staying working. He's staying persistent. You know. Now I never met Jeezy when I was out with y'all. Right. Um, when I was out there, but that was just that one time. Now. Jeezy was somehow affiliated with y'all. And I remember Jeezy even wore a Big Meat shirt when he was performing one of his songs at, at some, some uh, TV performance. Oh yeah, he, he, Jeezy was BMF right here, nigga. Jeezy, Jeezy, you know, he's definitely connected strongly. You know, um, the whole Jeezy situation, you know, came about when um, I was at a point uh, with BMF Entertainment to where, um, you know, I wanted to involve Southern artists with the label because we didn't have any and I was moving around with baby D but baby D was um, A part of the oop camp at the time so we couldn't like yeah. really sign baby D But that was like my partner baby D used to move around with me every day me and baby D used to move around the city And, and it was a southern bread mixtape and Jeezy had a song on it uh, a Dave Hollister remix that seeing you reminds me uh all the time I used to ride on doves, that song, I can do, I would do it again, but I can't, cause everything is different now, the time to sit your young ass down, cause these snitches then fucked up the game. I used to like that song and I used to play it a lot, and one night we was waiting for all the girls, the strippers to come out of Magic City so we could take them to the crib, and, and um, Jeezy was outside and his, and his old school was broke down, he was in a parking lot. And Baby D was like, oh, that go buddy right there who on song you be listening to. Right there, Lil J, that's the dude right there. So I jumped out and hollered at him, and that's how we, you know, clicked up. We ended up doing our first record, the Rich and Rock Ice record, and then we were just rocking out from there. And I liked the kids so much that, you know, I was like, yo, Meech, I'm finna really, really work with this dude. And you know what I'm saying? At first, you know, our people, they were so anti-new people coming around. It was a while before people really accepted Jeezy. You know, from the beginning, people was accepting Jeezy because of the strength of blue, on the strength of blue. You know, niggas are coming to, and, and we in Magic City standing on the stage tipping the strippers, and niggas are coming to the club like, yo, your man Jeezy outside, you go grab him. So I'd have to go to the front and grab, and you know, grab him, and he come in and party with us and all that. You know, we, we, we ended up really going places, you know what I'm saying, with, with that whole Jeezy situation. I think that, um, you know, he did the Bum B Over Here record and we really played a big part in that in the clubs and in all the different states we was in and promoting that record. And once we went down to Miami and he shot that video and had all the cars and, you know, when you look at that Over Here video, it's all BMF members in it. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't none of them other people that you see, you know, in these days or even after us when he had all the making guys with him and stuff. It was all BMF people in that video. Um, you know, from the Ferraris, the cars that was in it, you got candy shots of Throw and Bull and, 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 and Ill and, you know, all of the original BMF members, you know what I'm saying, in that video. So, you know, back then we was rocking hard and it was just feeling crazy. And I just think that after that, that issue with Wolf and, and, you know, that unfortunate incident, you know what I'm saying, um, you know, Jeezy kind of just spread his wings, you know what I'm saying? At that time, you know, I was fire hot back then about that shit. You know what I'm saying? But you know, nowadays I don't I don't blame him. You know what I'm saying? You know, it, it, I guess it just wasn't for him. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't have been the kind of person that if something like that happened, I just would have, you know, left off and just signed a bunch of record deals and, you know what I'm saying? And and, and just kind of, to me, it just felt like he didn't give a fuck where nobody else ended up at, no matter what people did for him, buying Jacob watches and and you know putting them in Ferraris and and Porsche trucks and, you know, just introducing them to that real West Coast lifestyle where, you, where you're wearing Cortez and Dickies now. and You know what I'm saying? This was the swag that my cousins from Compton and myself and my little brother, rest in peace, Baby Blue, had at the table that, that he was able to adapt, you know what I'm saying? And infuse with his swag that he already had, which created that character that you see to this day. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I definitely believe 
that, you know, we have some responsibility in that situation. You know, I can't claim a dollar amount or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? And I don't chase people around and ask them for money or nothing like that. And I'm and I'm actually proud of where he's taking it, though, you know, because he could have came out with that shit and we could have piped him up and he could have just fell off after we all went to prison or, or anything. You know what I'm saying? Before we went to prison, he could have fell off. But, he, you know, he was strong enough and smart enough to, to be able to keep it going and, and turn itself into a into a, a mogul. You know, I look at Jeezy like a mogul, like, you know, I go places. People love Jeezy. But I look at it like if you love Jeezy, baby, you love BMF because he's a product. What was the, the general feeling when Meech got sentenced to 30 years? I mean, my general feeling was shit. They just gave him 30 years. I don't know how much fucking time they finna give me. You know, it's my first time coming through this shit, going through it. I didn't know what the hell to expect. You know, I was just prayed up. You know what I'm saying? I was just praying for the, for the best for me, you know? Yeah. I never felt like I was going to get picked up, though. Like, I had put an album out. After me and them got picked up, I was on the road. I was on the tour bus. I was working. Yeah, I remember that. Okay, so so Meech gets thirty years. Did, did you and Meech talk after that? After he got locked up? Hey, you know what? So um, I ended up seeing Meech. You know, around one of the last people that got picked up on our case when he got picked up, I guess to scare him into into pleading guilty, they pulled all of our main people back. Like they were bringing us all back to court. We never went to court, but they brought us all back from our prisons. And that was to let him know that, hey, yo, this person's back. j Bo's here. Meech is here. Blue is here. You know, Tito's here. Doc is here. This person, that person's here. So he don't know what nobody's saying. You know what I'm saying? Even though didn't nobody say nothing. But this is the game that these people play. You know what I'm saying? To get you to plea out. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, at that time, when I was coming through transit, fucking Meech was coming through transit. So I'm in a holding cell in Tallahassee, Florida, and um, I just start hearing people saying, oh shit, Meech and Blue Da Vinci. And they was like, yo, Blue, here come Meech, here come Meech. And I'm thinking they playing. And then I, I jumped up and looked out the door, up the hallway, and here he come walking in. We rode all the way from Florida to Georgia together. You know, we sat next to each other on the bus and talked and laughed and shit about different shit. And just, you know, I hadn't seen him since 2005. And that was in 2010, which this happened. Um, so, you know, it had been five years since I seen him. So, you know, that, that was real good to just see my man. And, and, you know what I'm saying, just be able to holler at him since he had been in prison. You know what I'm saying? I never thought that I would be able to see him, you know, that quick. You know what I'm saying? Once he got sentenced and once we were all sentenced... You know what I'm saying? I, I didn't think I would, be, I would be able to see him that fast. You know what I'm saying? But that was cool. You know what I'm saying? And I still, like, when people go visit him, I send them messages and I send my love and he sends his love back. And, you know, we try to correspond as much as we can through other people because we can't directly correspond with each other. Oh, really? Why is that? I mean, I don't know. They just in there dragging him. You know, every, every letter I've tried to send or whatever always been sent back. Um, maybe because we're on the same case and... You know, they don't want us to communicate for whatever reasons or whatever. But, you know, we still have mutual people and his girl, you know, she always, you know, when she goes and visit him and stuff like that, she goes and gives him my message or brings me his message. And, you know, I got people from the streets all the time that write him letters and he writes them back and he tells everybody, holla at Blue, you know, Blue out there, he doing his thing, holla at Blue, he can, he can help you. I got like the whole world. It's called. It's on my Instagram, sh taking a screenshot of a of a letter from Meech, and it's, and they always zero in on the part where he's like holla at blue. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, but it's all love. He still got me working from where he at. One of the things that I, I read about in his book, and, and I remember hearing an interview, I think with Cavario, uh, with Meech, like over the phone, and you know, it went into how Meech never really talked on the phone. And he was saying how a lot of people went down because they were in love with the phone. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, they even had him pinned on a couple phone calls that played a part in his case. And it wasn't him. Through voice analyzation, they, fig they found out that it wasn't even him talking on the phone. But that stuff still played out in his sentencing. They never reversed it. You know, that stuff still played a part in his sentencing. And, it was, and he was found, you know, that it wasn't even him through voice analyzation. Y'all used to pull up and, like, 
like five Ferraris, five Lamborghinis, some Maseratis, like, you know, a bunch yeah. of Benzes. Like, the, the car game was on a whole different level. Oh, yeah, I remember at one time, bro, throughout the immediate crew, we had, like, two Phantoms, two Maybachs, three Porsche trucks, two H2 Hummers, uh, four 645 BMWs when those first came out. A couple X5s. Um, I remember, and then at that time, Meech had the regular 911 Turbo. Uh, the Gallardos came out. We had two Gallardos. I'm talking about like between the different properties, you just got all these exotic cars. I remember when Meech, Meech left Miami, I was living down in Miami, and he, he ran out for a few months. Um, and I was just over there. I was recording. I was in a, a studio house. I was living in a studio house at the time. And I was recording, and um, you know, I just go outside on a property, bro, and just look. One morning, I remember walking outside and just looking, and I just got this. Looks like a damn exotic car lot in my front yard. You know, when I open up my doors, just all of these forms. You might got two, two point five million dollars worth of cars in the front. You know what I'm saying? And I'm the only guy here. Me and a couple of my homeboys. You know what I'm saying? Just sitting over there. Not even enough people to drive all these cars. You know what I'm saying? And me used to just leave them joints, leave me with all the keys and be like, listen, you got your couple cars, don't let nobody drive none of my cars. And you really don't need to drive my cars either unless you really need to or you really trying to switch up your look or something. Other than that, leave mine alone. You know what I'm saying? But it's like $2 million worth of cars outside. I mean, it, it seemed like the, the level of brotherhood around y'all was something that you don't really see very often. And I remember feeling that as soon as I came around. You know, it's like, okay, these dudes really just kind of, like, respect each other. Right. You know what I mean? It ain't, you know, you know, you have family, but family, you sometimes don't fuck with each other. It seemed like there was a, a level of respect that just carried across the board. Yeah, I mean, we definitely, um, you know, ha have respect for one another. Like, you know, Meech made it possible for everybody to, to eat, bro. Like, we didn't have the broke guy that was mad because the other guy had more than, you know, we didn't have that issue because everybody, every, I mean, when I tell you the trash man was driving, the guy who was responsible for taking the trash out was moving around in $100,000 bins. You know what I'm saying? So when you're playing the game at that level, you know, you don't even have time for the bullshit, Vlad. Like, we don't have time to beef with each other because we're so busy getting to the money. You know, we're so busy spending money and being happy and taking care of our families Bro, that we don't have time to bicker and quarrel with each other, amongst each other, you know? Meech ended up getting 30 years, right? Right. Meech and, and his brother right. each got 30 years. 150 people got indicted. Okay, S something like that. Uh, do you know how many people actually went to prison? Any idea? Everybody that got indicted went to prison. Really? So 150 people went to prison? I mean, I don't know that that exact number, that number does. But something, something like that. Yeah, a, bunch, a load of people went to prison, yeah. And for some amount of time, some people did months, some people did a couple years, some people did a few years, you know, some people did six years, some people did seven years, some people did nine years, some people did actual 10, you know, then you go on up, some more people did more time, you know, and, 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 and it was a lot of time handed out, I know that, a lot of man hours, buddy. Meech went in before you did, right? Yeah. Uh, at that, that, and most of the people um, was indicted in 2005. You know, there wasn't any information out on me um, 2000 or 2003, 2004. Um, you know, my, my, I believe my information was backdated um, and, and, and finagled to get an indictment on me. If you notice, I didn't get indicted until like a whole year and some change later, I believe, after the first wave of indictments came out because they had to still build a case against me because I'm a fucking entertainer, you know what I'm saying, at the end of the day. I had to admit to some shit that I didn't do, you know what I'm saying, just so I can go ahead and, and, and get my admission of guilt in a timely manner. All of these things uh, play a part in, in sentencing, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and what you know what they offer you. You know, it was my first offense and I, and I um, um, when I say cooperated, I, do, I don't mean cooperate in a, in, a, in a snitch or a rat manner. But when you use the correct terms, um, 
to be eligible for a safety valve is, is what you could be eligible for with your first offense. You know, you can't have violence. It's a bunch of stipulations, but you have to cooperate in a timely manner. Cooperating means not fighting, not telling on somebody. So I want to make that clear so people understand. This is not telling on someone else to get someone else time, but this is admitting guilt in a timely manner, meaning that you didn't jump up and say, fuck that, I didn't do it. I'm finna go fight and I'm taking this shit to trial. You feel me? And then when you see some evidence come out, you're like, oh, all right, well, forget it. Then I'm going to just go ahead and admit guilt. See, I didn't do none of that shit. I was like, yo, all right, that is, this is what they said I did. This is what I did. So give me my time. How much time am I going to get? Let me get work me out something, uh, some deal. Give me some action. This is my first offense. I've never been in prison. This is some bullshit. Number two. This guy that you say and said whatever he said about me is facing 57 years and two bodies or something. Like, come on, be serious. But y'all finna try to give me 17 years? All right, matter of fact, hurry up. Stop the tape. Yeah, I did it. So just give me the time and then let's go. You know what I'm saying? But you know, everything worked out good for me. You know what I'm saying? I was, I was able to, to, to receive a, a role adjustment at my sentencing. You know, and not to even get into all that long played out shit, but... At the end of the day, nigga, during my sentencing, they adjusted my role from an average role to a minor role. I had an open-ended plea, meaning I wasn't subjected to the mandatory minimum of 10 years that my, um, that my charge carried. You know, and the way that my attorney, the way that my team um, put, my, put my plea together was perfect. And, and it's what enabled me to come from 10 years down to five years and four months. You know what I'm saying? I had an open-ended plea, which didn't have me capped off. I was awarded the safety valve, and then I also was awarded a a, a, re, a point reduction for for a role change from average role to minor role, and and that's how I came off slick with with, with the time that I did get. You know what I'm saying? Which I'm I'm still to this day I'm very grateful for. You know what I'm saying? So what were you actually convicted of? They held me responsible. They tried to hold me responsible for 150 kilos or more. And it was, uh, I'm trying to think of the actual fucking charge. It was um, distribution with intent of five kilos okay. or more. Okay. But they had you tied, tied up into 150 kilos. See, they just gave me the max. That's the max amount of drugs that they can charge you with. Like, any, they're basically like anything over 150, fuck it. But, you know, at the end of the day, I came out of that. You know what I'm saying? They couldn't res hold me responsible for that because of where they held me on the family tree. You know, you had the, the DEA's um, family tree, and, and I was somewhere on the bottom of that shit with the drivers and shit. You know, because they added me so late. They added me at the end. Once they was getting all the information from the real rats, they, add, they, they didn't have the information on me. They added me at the end. And then they pulled somebody that was trying to get all that time cut, the, the, the William Marshall character. And he went in and, and, back, and I believe backdated some statements because how it happened was, you know, when we, when they, when we moved for the, for the role adjustment at my sentencing, the uh, the uh, prosecution went for a recess and they came back and tried to charge me a 924G, I believe, for a firearm that didn't exist. And they said that all the houses that they raided had guns in them, but they never raided my house. And one of my house, my house was one of the houses in question, which, in which William Marshall said that he's seen me receive 80 to 100 kilos on at least six occasions. And one occasion he remembered in particular, which was a, a party that I had for... Um, with all my family and rappers and stuff there, like drugs would be there, right? Um, but it was for 4th of July, I believe, 2003. And um, that's what really stung me. That's what got me my indictment, him in these statements. But when the judge asked, well, which firearms were found in Mr. McKnight's house when it was raided? And the prosecution had to say, you know, well, Mr. McKnight's house was never raided. You know, that threw the judge for a loop. She's like, well, all the time I've been on the bench, if you got a guy that comes and talk about five houses in question with multi-kilogram shipments coming to each house, every house gets raided. So how come Mr. McKnight's house, which is me, how come his house was never raided? And, and this man said there was, what, close to 500 keys that he saw come through this house, and nobody had an answer. Everyone claims what they claim, but then once, once trials happen and people are looking at ye long years and stuff like that, you know, you really see that, you know, the real character of somebody. Right. Like when, when all these 150 indictments happen, 
you know, what percentage of the people really stayed, you know, faithful to everyone else and didn't, and didn't cooperate? To be honest with you, bro, um, the indictment was broken down, I believe, into three parts. There was like an Atlanta, a Detroit, and a Los Angeles, three different indictments. And I was a part of the Atlanta indictment. So all my paperwork had to deal with people that were involved with the Atlanta indictment. So I don't have paperwork on, on the rest of the people like Meech's brothers, people, and you know, all those guys. I don't really know. I saw, I've, I've seen things here and there, but I don't have like the case, like how I've got our case from Atlanta. I've got every word that was said by everybody or that wasn't said by everybody. Um, so, but if I had to just put it in perspective, yeah. I, w I would say like, you know, a good, 70% kept it solid, which is a nice percentage, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. M more than, more than I'm sure, 90% of the time. Right. So 30% 30, 30 of the people turned. I would say about that, you know, it was, it was, it was a few snitches, real, real life snitches, you know, involved in that situation. You know, people that were just trying to save their ass and they didn't give a fuck who they fucked up trying to do it, you know? Have you ever run into any of these guys? No, nah, I ain't seen nobody. I ain't seen nobody that told on me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I, you know, I did see Omari in prison when he was supposed to be coming and testifying on Meech, but he never did it. Um, you know, I had a chance to talk to him before Meech's sentencing came up, before Meech's stuff was even done. And I guess they pulled the kid back from state prison, you know, because he was going to give some information that was going to get his time cut. But I don't know if it was seeing me in there or, you know, what, how he had to change a heart or whatever it was, but he never went to court. So, so this guy was going to testify against Meech and ended up changing his mind before he took the stand. Right, but he had already gave the information, so it don't matter. He's still told. You did? What, what was the total number of years you did? Like four. So I had, four years. I had five years, four months. You wanted to subtract the good time from that, which is like, I don't know. I don't remember now, but and then I was awarded a year off for taking the um, the 500-hour residential drug program. So once I successfully completed that, they awarded me um, one year off of my sentence, and then that plus the good time, I subtract from five year and four months since like right at four years of actual prison time. You got to remember one thing, bro. Like a lot of this stuff has to do with um with with your person, you know what I'm saying, with criminal history. Like when you're dealing with the feds, it ain't just like the state where you know it's 10 years, do one, and you can go home. You know, the, the, the sentence carries 12 years, do two years, and you can be on parole. Now nah, it's like a it's, a, it's a guideline, it's a sentencing guideline, and it's a graph to where you have a criminal history and then your charge. So your criminal history runs around, uh, runs the top, and then your, your offense level runs down this graph. And then you've got to find yourself on this graph. And that shows you how much time, you know, between what time and what time, 160 months or 80 to 160 months or whatever. Okay. You know, and wherever you fall on that, on that guideline is how the feds work. You know what I'm saying? It, it works totally different than the state um, system. Okay. Now, what was the hardest part about being in prison? Because that was the first time you were ever in prison. Right. The hardest part was just being away from my kids, bro. You know what I'm saying? Even though I was away from them, you know, for times on the streets, you know, because I'm moving around in different places, different states and doing my thing. But I was still able to jump up, fly them in or fly out, pop up on them and take them, you know, to, to Six Flags or, you know, go to the movies and, you know, just stop everything I'm doing and fly to L.A. and stay for a week or two weeks or a month or whatever. You know, I had the freedom to do what I wanted to do when I don't have the freedom at all. And, you know, it, it's hard, you know, knowing that you got to be away from them and I can't be there for them like how I want to or when I when they need me. You know what I'm saying? It seemed like they, they need you most when you can't get there, you know. So that that was for me. That was the hardest part. Everything else. It was a breeze, you know what I'm saying? I was at a low. I wasn't at no, I wasn't in no pen. I didn't have no violence in my case. So you know what I'm saying? It was, a, it was easy jail time that I did. The hardest part was not being able to see them kids when they wanted to see me and when I wanted to just be with them. I had a brand new daughter at the time, you know what I'm saying? She was like 
you know, eight months or something when I got locked up. You know what I'm saying? So she had to grow up, you know, her first years with me in prison. Like she grew up knowing me from being in there. You know what I'm saying? She didn't know me from being on the streets. She knew me from a visitation room. You know, so those are the hardest things for me. I mean, I'm a family man, bro. I'm big on family. You know what I'm saying? So everything else was cool. I had money. Like, I, didn't, I wasn't broke in there, you know. And then I had a nice support system. I had some girls that was looking out for me. And, you know, family was, was there for me at, at the same time. And, you know, the, the dudes on the compound, it was cool. Niggas respected me. You know what I'm saying? Niggas know I ain't snitch and my paperwork was there on the compound and stuff like that. So, you know, I walked the yard. I wasn't in no protective custodies or none of that shit. You know what I'm saying? And I just sat there and did my time, bro, and, and made me a plan for when I got home. And I'm still executing that plan as we speak. There was a book that was written about BMF. Uh, did you read it? Uh, I read parts of it. The parts that was, you know, was saying bad stuff and, you know, untruths and things like that. I was, I was, you know, getting the kick out of it. The book that Mara wrote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's still, she, nobody's seen Mara to this day. Yo, she's so filthy rich off that book. It's, it's pathetic. I was in prison. I couldn't get a dollar. I was so mad. I was like, yo, hold up. Who's getting the money from this? This, this book was on sale for $25 for three years. <laughs> I never seen a book on sale for, for, the, for, for what it came out as. You know, when, when something usually goes on sale, it's cheaper than the introductory price, right? This book, this book is probably still $25 to this day. Yo. She probably sold 10 million copies. She's so filthy rich somewhere. I want to see her bank account right now. <laughs> I didn't know that you guys weren't, you know, associated with it because it seemed like a lot of inside info. I mean, what it was was Mara Salhoop was following us around and asking people. She's the kind of person that was asking people once we left the club. So what did you, what just happened? Oh my God! So that was really BMF, and that, what, that was their cars, and what did they do in the club? And she's reporting right behind everything that we were doing, like you know. And I don't know how she she got cool with Meech, and I don't think that Meech ever understood. She was one. She was one of the first people that blamed blamed him for Wolf's homicide back in what 2003 or whatever right when i arrived when when i i hung out with you guys that had happened and meach was on house arrest oh right right so he was still on yeah at the house over there yeah but see she was one of the first people to 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 to, to convict him you know what i'm saying and he had barely even been charged with it and she had just ran him through 12 all 12 jurors and had him convicted, you know what I'm saying, off the rip. So I've never been too fond of Mara. Plus, she tried to drag me in. You know, she painted me as a rat in this in this book, basically. You know, and she had some truth to what she was um, talking about, like the part about um, me being in the courtroom and being tearful, because I was, you know, I, I'll never denounce that. You know, in the courtroom where you're getting sentenced and, and, and you know you're gonna be away from your kids and your kids are sitting right there in the back, I don't think that you would be the most happy camper. You know, I'm looking at my, I believe at that time, my eight, seven and, and four year old, or eight and four year old in the, in, the back of, in the back of the courtroom, you know, along with their mom and my mom and, you know, my sister and family, you know, and they telling me, I don't know how much time I'm finna get, but you know, they asking me like, you know, what, do you have anything to say for myself? And all I could do was turn around and look at my kids, tearful, you know, and apologize to them. You know, at the end of the day, you know, I, I apologize to my kids because they the ones that was finna miss out, you know, on, on being able to share that time with their dad and, you know, time that you can never get back. You know what I'm saying? So that was the only part for me, you know, about me, you know, that, that I even really fucked with you know what i'm saying and, and when she was trying to destroy my character by even saying that you know but what what you know was not understood was that's what made my character things like that is what makes my character stronger because this this is what entails that i'm a human being and not some bmf robot you know what i'm saying i do have feelings i do have family you know what i'm saying i'm going to fucking prison like no i'm not fucking happy right now and i shouldn't be going in the first place you know what i'm saying but i got this bitch She's reporting some bullshit, you know, trying to, I don't understand how the person that was, that helped 
us get fucked up by all the shit she was reporting in this fucking creative loafing is the person that made the most money off BMF to this day. <laughs> How the fuck does that happen, Vlad? I thought you guys were somehow involved in it. Um, nah, I mean, nah, Meech didn't get a dime from that book. But he, he okayed it. You know what I'm saying? He had her come. She was able to go to prison and sit down and interview him from my understanding. Of course, I wasn't there. But, mm. you know, and things like that. But there was nobody around to tell him, you know, this is the bitch that said that you killed two people back in 2003 before the story even broke, right? You know, I wasn't there to tap him on the shoulder and remind him. Like, this is not a person that has our best interests at heart. And I'm not sure if he even talks to her to this day. But I bet you that account she got over there is full. She took a bunch of public record and put it into a book. You know, and and had it some 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 not truths and some half truths in there to excite it a little bit more, and she sold a book. I'm not mad at her for for selling a book. You know what I'm saying? To me, it was smart. She was smart for doing it. I just hate that. No, you know, my brother died, and I wasn't able to give his mom any money off the book when he's, you know, um, mentioned in this book. You know, he's gone, and his mom is still here, and she's out here, and she needs help as well, as well as Meech's mom. And I don't know where she was cut in in the book. You know, of course, Meech can't benefit anything from it because he's in prison. But what do you have for him put away? Or what are you doing for his kids now that this book with his whole life story is out there? And, and, and you've got this book with a, B, a big BMF acronym that I created that I couldn't stop and do nothing about at the time because they finagled and did all of this crazy shit with the paperwork and a name and, and, and all of this different stuff while I was in prison. And then I just got this person off of everything that we've been through, Vlad, you know, off of all of the punches in the club and, you know, all of the, all of the, you know, the, the, the issues that we did have internally and, and stuff like that to people catching all of this time and nobody could reap the benefit of, from us. Like, that's crazy. You know what I'm saying? And for her not to reach out to, to people and see what's going on, even in 2015. You know, it's just it's just asinine and I don't understand it, but it's cool because everything happens for a reason and God works in mysterious ways, you know.